Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name's David Thoreau, and I'm the president of the Independent Institute. I'm delighted to have you all join with us this evening for the first program in our Independent Policy Forum for this new century. The Independent Policy Forum, as many of you may know, is a regular series of lectures, seminars, debates, and panel discussions featuring top scholars and policy analysts held here at the Independent Institute's Conference Center in Oakland, California. As many of you know, the Institute regularly sponsors programs such that, as this, along with many of the conference and media projects that we do, and the book and other publications programs that we sponsor. Our program tonight is entitled Freedom, Terror, and Falsehoods, Lessons from the 20th Century. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Robert Conquest, who will be speaking based on his widely acclaimed new book, Reflections on a Ravaged Century, which has been getting ex extremely good reviews. In fact, Bob was a little nervous that perhaps it's getting too good reviews. For those of you new to the Institute, there was uh, information in the packets that you hopefully received when you registered. For those of you joining with us by C-SPAN, you may visit our website at www.independent.org for further information about our many projects and programs, including our journal, The Independent Review. Uh, this is the fall issue, which has been uh, sold out, as I understand, on newsstands. The new issue that was just published um, has a special emphasis on Asia, which relates in part to the topics that will be addressed this evening. More specifically, the Independent Institute is a non-politicized, non-profit, academic public policy research organization. And we get involved in virtually any and all kinds of social and economic issues. The results, as I mentioned, are published as books. And the Institute is supported by foundations, businesses, civic organizations, and individuals. In your packets, you'll also find a schedule of upcoming events. Our next event for the Independent Policy Forum will be held on February 2nd. The program will be discussing saving the environment, and the question will be government friend or foe. The speakers will be Peter Huber, who is senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, and Michael D'Alessi, who is director of the Center for Private Conservation, as well as Thomas Graff from the Environmental Defense Fund, and Sally Fairfax from the University of California at Berkeley. The, the event after that will be held on February 15th, and the topic then will be the issue of global warming. The question then will be, is it scientific fact or not? The speaker will be Dr. Fred Singer, who's president of the Science and Environmental Policy Project. He's also first director of the US Weather Satellite Service. For this evening, we are indeed privileged to have with us one of the great historians, authors, poets, and quite frankly, literary masters of the 20th century to reflect on the past 100 years. Many of us have seen discussions of the past century and the millennium, of course, in the media. As economic liberalization has expanded around the globe, freeing more and more people to choose their own paths and to work to improve their own lives, their own futures, this past century has experienced perhaps the most dramatic changes that we've seen in the history of mankind. Economic, social, and technological advances have made far more people than ever able to advance on an incredible scale. In fact, the scale is really going off the charts. But this century has also been the home of the greatest terrors, the greatest terrors of human history. It seems to me that it's interesting that some people have apparently lost sight of this fact that little more than just 10 years ago, the Berlin Wall came down. Indeed, the single greatest event of the century, perhaps, has been the rise and fall of totalitarian regimes. The 20th century has indeed witnessed government-sponsored carnage on an unprecedented scale. We may indeed recoil in learning of the shootings at schools around the country, but nothing compares with the deliberate and wholesale slaughter of millions and millions of people in countries around the world. 
In the course of such horrors, literally billions of people have further lived under the yoke of oppression and economic and social devastation of the total state in many parts of the world. And furthermore, this astounding story is not over, as we have witnessed in recent years, the incredible genocides in Africa, in Indonesia, and many other countries. What made this era susceptible to genocide along the lines of Hitler's final solution, Stalin's gulag, Mao's great leap forward, Pol Pot's killing fields, and other atrocities? Could the answer lie in the rogue ideologies that have been so popular in certain intellectual circles, and not just in those countries, but also in the West? Ideologies that uphold the power of the state over the individual and the institutions of civil society. How can we understand the rise of such ideologies and how can we predict the 20th century that we will not have a return to such destruction? For decades, many in the West refused to recognize the true nature of either what some have considered to be right and left-wing collectivism in Europe, Asia, and elsewhere. However, in the midst of this ignorance and intellectual fallacy, Robert Conquest's work through his painstaking research and his many seminal books began exposing the realities of statism. In so doing, Dr. Conquest's lonely pursuit of truth has proven that the power of ideas can indeed triumph over tyranny. Robert Conquest was born in Malvern, England on July 15, 1917. He was educated at Winchester College, the University of Grenoble, and Oxford University where he received his MA and Doctor of Literature. During World War II, Conquest served with the, the Oxfordshire and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry. He also served under Soviet command against the Nazis in Bulgaria in 1944. After the war, he joined the British Foreign Service and received postings in Bulgaria and New York, the latter as part of the British delegation to the United Nations, which of course was just forming at that time. Since 1956, Dr. Conquest has pursued virtually a full-time academic career, congruent with the publication of books such as The Great Terror and The Harvest of Sorrow. He held positions at the London School of Economics, Columbia University, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He now resides in California, where he is a senior research fellow and scholar curator at the, at the Hoover Institution and deals with a Russian and East European collection. He also serves as an adjunct fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., and is a member of the advisory board of Freedom House in New York City. In addition to his achievements as an historian, Dr. Conquest is also a respected poet and writer. He's been the literary editor of The Spectator magazine and is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and the British Interplanetary Society. For instance, Nobel laureate Alexander Solzhenitsyn selected him to translate his book-length poem, Prussian Nights. And we're very privileged to have him as a member of the editorial board of advisors for our journal, The Independent Review. So I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Robert Conquest. Well, that was very kind, kindly put. Uh, unfortunately, you've, you, you gave about half my speech already. <laughs> but, but that's all right. There's always more to say on these subjects. Uh, the last time I sp spoke at your institute, you gave me, very kindly gave me an award, and I didn't have to speak much because they had several people speaking for me. And they, were, they included both conservatives and others. And Cheslav Milos came down and he said to you, as I remember, I don't usually come to conservative institutions. I just come because I agree with Robert Conquest on certain points. And, I, and I, I'm not even sure I'm a conservative myself, to tell you the truth, David. The, the, um, but, but I think what does arise is there are a lot of people who we wouldn't call conservatives who nevertheless agree together on a great deal of what I shall be saying and a great deal of what I've been 
writing about the Soviet Union and elsewhere. It's, um, it's, it's, if, it's, one of them expressed it to me roughly as follows. With our, all our disagreements, we form a united front against nonsense. And that's, that's, I, I think, think that's true. Well, as David Thoreau says, the, the horrors of our time have been very remarkable. It was the Russian writer Vasily Grossman who put it in a slightly different way when he said that the power of the totalitarian, the, the, I think he put it, the, the, um, uh, the, the violence of the totalitarian system, the extreme violence of the totalitarian systems was able to crush the human spirit throughout whole continents. It wasn't merely killing people, it was crushing their independent thought. And that, of course, it's not simply lying. It is forcing you to believe and assert what you don't believe, not just lying to you. It's forcing the lie deep into your soul. And that, I think, was one of the main points of the, the ideologies. Now, I'm supposed to be, in a sense, talking about this century. But if we, I was asked to, I don't know if you see the Los Angeles Times. They had a piece, uh, people gave their opinions of the most neglected book of the century. And I put in, perhaps a bit strangely, Norman Cohn's The Pursuit of the Millennium, which is about the late 15th century, early 16th century, millenarian sects in Germany and elsewhere. And, but he makes it perfectly clear that he is talking also about, and he says so, about Chinese and Russian communists. Because the first thing to ask about the totalitarian ideas, these destructive ideas which have wreaked massive horror in our century, is how did they spread? Who accepted them? And he, he describes the, uh, the stratum that did accept them. Back in those days, it was a, a rather low-grade intelligentsia, people who'd somehow got a priestly education without becoming priests, odd dropouts from the gentry's younger sons, and among the poor, not the, the poor as such, but people who didn't fit in any particular category of poverty or anything else. And he makes the point that this is what the sort of intelligentsia, as it were, which is what accepted in China and Russia and elsewhere, the, the idea, the capital I idea. And the capital I idea then and now had the same basic notion that um, heaven can be constructed on earth first. Secondly, I think that you, you emerge your identity with the movement, with the party or the sect, whatever it happened to be. And thirdly, that you, you want it all at once. I think it's Kierkegaard who says somewhere that the two great faults in thinking these days, or in his century, uh, are um, uh, laziness and impatience. And I think these are the two, two things which mark the reception, not, not, not the actual taking on of the ideology, but the type of mind which is going to take on an ideology. Uh, laziness, meaning not being unable to bother to cope with the complications of reality. Uh, try and get it all done in one smart fix. And impatience, have it now. And the, the, I think that this is extremely uh, important to try and get some feel for the sort of people who, who took on these ideologies. Now, the ideologies, you may say, are dead, but this mindset is not dead and still exists around the world. Now, in my book, I, after making these rather saddening remarks, we, we have to ask ourselves, how did we manage to avoid that? They didn't come to power in the West. And not, what is more, the Western society proved both more, in the long run, both stronger and more effective, and, and, and in, in a general sense, more adjusted to the future than these alleged super-futurologists. Now, how, I think we ought to look at Western society from the point of view that it doesn't seek perfection, 
it's, it's evolved for over a thousand years in the, in the English and Scottish and Swiss cases at least, for from almost from tribal times with a certain balance between various parts of society, often each some oppressing others, but, but never getting, accepting, except for very short periods, not enough to destroy the general feelings, never accepting that the executive can do what it likes, or that compromises mustn't be reached, and never looking forward to a century in the future. So we can, if we can cope with our present problems, that's pretty good. You can't see very far into the future. You can see dim shapes a few years into the future. You can see dangers which must be coped with now. But you do, you do not fall into utopia. And it didn't affect, the utopian dream did not affect anybody in real power in the West, either from people fighting for power from below or people imposing power from above. And that was the open, that was meant, I think, by the open society in the historical sense. Now, how did the next, of course, the next thing was who challenged this on a big scale and to some extent penetrated the Western mind. And of course, one first and still most powerful trend is, is what we, is Marxism. I mean, one, you may say that Marxism is dead in a sense. Intellectually, it's dead. I, I did remember writing a piece some years ago saying it's now only found in its pure form like the spotted owl in a few, few enclaves in California. But, but um, nevertheless, its principles uh, uh, exist still. The principle of perfectionism and the principle of an enemy who must be destroyed before you get the perfect society, which was the other great uh, center of, of, of all ideology. Now, basically, how did this all start? I think my, my way of looking at it is you go back to John Locke and here we have a guy who, who actually theorizes about the free society, the open society. But he's theorizing in, in a context which knows what he's talking about and he takes for granted the, the, the semi-democratic, the semi-liberty and law society which was already in existence. But when he was transferred to France, the French didn't know about that. They thought theory is all you need. What was taken for granted in, in, in England was, was simply omitted in France, and you got the beginnings, the first roots of both Marxism and Nazism, in a sense, that you got the idea that reason will triumph. Reason can tell us everything. You got people like Condorcet, who was a mathematician, who thought, not unlike some writers nowadays that you could probably in the long run predict society by theory, by mathematics, which I fear is a heresy still around these days in a different form. But so they produced the notion of the rational, the triumph of reason, the totally rational society. You remember Chesterton once said that uh, a lunatic is a man who's lost everything except his reason. <laughs> and this is the sort of thing you got in France. You came, they came to power thinking that they, that first of all they represented the truth, reason, so everybody else was going against the light and became an enemy of the people, which is an invention of the French revolution, the idea of the enemy of the people. And then they thought they had, they had the answers. And of course this failed, and they, they as a famous French writer put it, the, the excesses of the revolution were nothing but the tantrums of a disappointed child, one way of looking at it. But anyway, from France they declared both for the people, the friend of the people, and the nation, one and indivisible. And so from them you get, get Marx, who took the people idea rather than the nation idea. And he provided, of course, the extra science. It, I think it's difficult to th remember now, or to think now, how extraordinary in the, say, the 1840s and 50s, it, the extraordinary dynamic of the period. There was a huge industrial ex expansion. There were the railways, there was science, there was biology, there were physics. 
though there was archaeology very importantly, that there was an enormous boom in knowledge and power, economic power, and it did look as though somehow the future was in that. And I think if you look back on Marx now, it's extraordinary how which I call temporarily parochial he is. He saw the industrial working class. He saw the steaming factories. And he thought, this is the future. The working class is a special grade, unlike anybody else before, who will be the future, will take over, destroy the the wicked, the capitalists, of course. And he, he looked forward to a vast area, vast industrialization. And uh, I, I put it in the book, in, in one sense, the victory of the West in the Cold War is the victory of Silicon Valley over Magnitogorsk, because the Russians did produce, they went on investing in steel and coal. It, it was a sort of, old, what I find about Marxism, it's got a sort of musty taste, musty smell about it. But um, in that sense, well, I don't want to simply develop an analysis of Marxism, though I'd have, it, have a chapter on its various faults. Its predictions all failed. And I think it's a good point to make that it's rather odd an alleged great philosopher, great historian, great economist, that practically no philosophers or historians or economists have followed him. There are some, but not very many. Professionals don't, but the, uh, we should trace. I think before going on to the, the real excesses of Marxism, that the nationality side, which also derived from the French Revolution and the the original nationalist movements in Europe, were usually of a Jacobin type, revolutionary in, in the old sense, and only eventually deteriorated into a more taken over by the German state and so on. But there, but there again, the, the West, the Scottish and, and, and British and English and Swiss and so on, had an advantage, I think, over the French, not so much the French, but over some of the other countries in Europe, in that the, the, the nation evolved in somewhere like England. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't created from above by the state or by agitators saying, hey, you're an Englishman. But this, and in countries of Eastern Europe, not of Eastern Europe particularly, the, the nationalities were, to some extent, the creation of the, the state and the intellectuals. They didn't have the settled downness, which was, would have been um, perhaps more useful in the historical sense. But, but nevertheless, the, a crucial moment came, of course, on the nas- question of nationality, when Mussolini decided, who had been a, a, a Marxist, a left-wing Marxist, in fact, who decided that the people must merge themselves, not with the masses, but with the nation. He switched. And fascism came, and later National Socialism derived from that switch, the identification Again, identification with a huge non-personal phenomenon and a great social or, or, or ideological group, but a different just changed direction. And it's very striking, incidentally, how many uh, communists became fascists in the 30s and vice versa. There was a move. Hitler always said he could turn a communist into a Nazi and he couldn't turn a social democrat into a Nazi. The, 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 the wish to get absorbed in an ideology was there, and it just changed focus. Well, we, we at least lost Nazism uh, some years ago, but the, the, that has not been the great international bane that, that communism has been. But I think one ought to say, before going on about what happened in Russia at all, one ought to say that, that nowadays there are in many countries in the world, there is something like a national socialist regime. There is a, a, a ruler and a ruling party who are ruling, from people's point of view, to put down the bad rich and the wicked foreigner. You think for a dozen countries of the world that, that obviously applies to. So though national socialism has a 
dogma has gone, the sort of practical national socialism still exists. Not, not of, the, quite of the same type, naturally. But, however, in Russia, why Russia when we come to communism? Well, first of all, there's a country which had no political experience at all. They had no experience of political reality of, of any of the, what went on in the West. And so, and so they developed the intelligentsia, which, remember, is a Russian word, imported, unfortunately, into this country, but, but not only the word, but the thing, I fear, to some extent, <laughs> not, not, not only this country. And they had, they had no experience, whatever, of real politics, of a society, of a community, and, and eventually, of course, without developing the history of it, if you know, the, a group of them were able to take over. I've always <coughs> thought the anarchist Bakunin back in the 1870s g got the Marxists right in a way, where he said that what they want is a pedantocracy. What he meant was they want rule by a group of intellectuals consisting of them, although they wouldn't call themselves rule by intellectuals. And I think th that was to some, some extent the, the motivation. The, they, were all, they had their ideas, but they also had the notion of they want to take over. And this applies in a number of countries today. As, as you know, there are many countries where they have twice as many lawyers as can get jobs. So what's the, what are they going to do? They'll throw off the regime, take on an ideology, and then you'll be the Minister of Justice in the next government. I mean, one, one doesn't want to dismiss these uh, irrational or hidden motives at all. Well now in Russia. Russia then, here we come on to the real center of our pr problem, the, the question of falsifications. But I think in the intro, in, you call it lies, do you, or? Falsehoods. Falsehoods, I prefer falsifications. But, but um, because, anyway, to, to, to do that part briefly, Russia, by 1929, 1930, put through the, the regimes, the communist theory, into, into complete practice. They hadn't been quite able to for the few, some years before. But they finally got control and did the collectivization of, of the land, of the peasantry, and the alleged industrial planning. And it was a total failure. So they were faced with the problem of what do we do? There were two methods, of course. One is to say, I'm very sorry and resign. The other one was to say, um, and that's the, that is what they chose to do. Is there were, there were two, two ways of doing it. Uh, when an industry failed, you either shot the Minister of Transport, who happened to be Minister of Steel, because it failed, or she said it hadn't failed. There were two, two ways of dealing with it. But anyway, as you then had a Russia, of Soviet Union, in, there were two sorts. There was the real one, which nobody was allowed to refer to at all, and this entirely fan fantasy one, which had terrific successes, both economically and spiritually and everything else. Um, and the, the one which actually existed where everybody was in a terrible state, the poverty was bad, the people were losing instruction, they weren't, the, the, the lies were being spread and nothing could be done about it. And nothing could be said in Russia against it, not a word. In the middle of the great famine in 33, if you said there was a famine, you were arrested. If you said it was the government's fault, you were shot. That solved the famine, apart from the 10 million odd who died. But this, this applied throughout the Soviet period. They maintained that they had, they had correctly put into practice Marx's views, and so they had, of course, is the answer to that. They, they had done what Lenin and Marx had, Lenin, Lenin's Marxism had foreseen. And they'd also maintained the other view that everybody uh, who didn't accept their opinions, both foreign and home, were enemies in some sense. They maintained a state of personal, total enmity to the whole world including communist regimes which didn't agree with them. They counted as fascist, as in Yugoslavia. But I, I think the actual, it, it's, a, it's a huge subject, the, the sort of falsification that took place. It, it's almost unbelievable, the, the amount of 
extreme falsehood that was imposed on the population. The, the, the census figures were faked by several million. The, and of course, the, they were, amongst other things, the, the fake trials. And, and the falsification was, in the first place, it, it, you, expression of individual opinion could easily get you into trouble, and many writers were shot or would have been otherwise crushed. Then, uh, uh, as Anna Martova, the poet, said, nobody could understand Russia who hadn't listened all the time to the Soviet radio blasting from every lamppost. It, it was hammered in, and even people like Sakharov felt that they'd, they'd been beaten about the head somehow. It took them years to come out from under Stalinism. And, of course, uh, the, the, the whole terror, which we're not even hardly talking about, the millions who were shot or died in camps, that everybody who was tried was tortured to produce false confessions. There's not only a, a, a false, wonderful Soviet Union, there's also a false group of horrible enemies. It, it was entire, total, vicious fantasy right from the start. Well, bad enough, you may say. But then we come around to what happened to the lies when they reached the West. And this is a, a tale of horror for all of us, that when you think of what was said or written in the 1930s by Westerners, who weren't under any compulsion to do so, about the Soviet Union, they believed almost anything. They, they, could, they believed the, the, tr the truth of the fake great public trials of the 30s. They believed, in some cases, that collectivization had been a success. They even believed there wasn't a famine. And these were partly this was reporters like Walter Duranty, who sent the New York Times his accounts of how the peasants were flourishing, though he told other people he estimated about 10 million dead. And they were printed in the West. There were two stories available in the West. One, that there was a famine. Another, that there wasn't. And many in the West just accepted the first story without checking. And the, the great, the, well, I'm tempted to go on forever on that one, but let me just, I can't go without mentioning Sidney and Beatrice Webb, the leaders, the heads of Western social science, the founders of the London School of Economics, former Labour minister. And they read this huge book, Soviet Communism, A New Civilization. And they, they, with a question mark in the first edition, which they took out in 1937, of the worst year, they, they removed the question mark. And it's pure fantasy. It entirely deals, it presents the official story. They were going around, oh, they have elections and trade unions. <coughs> well, they had, quote, elections and, quote, trade unions. But these were good enough for the webs. And the webs were not unique. There were so, quite a few other people who did the same. People like H.G. Wells with, met Stalin and were so charmed by him. They said, this guy isn't a dictator, he's just loved by the people, the, the, without checking at all. Well, this died out a bit, or quite a lot, when the Nazi-Soviet pact came in in '39. But it revived, not quite in the same form, but it revived later. And even in the 80s, there were academics in the West who were denying, more or less in denial, of what had happened under Stalinism. Um, the, the academics who came up in the, during the war didn't. They'd seen what had happened. They'd been probably in the army or in, in political affairs somewhere and had first-hand experience. Then you've got a new lot who never left the other corner of their university. And I can understand why they couldn't believe. It's difficult to believe what happened under Stalin. But still, if they didn't know, they shouldn't have spoken. And there are books still coming out which are highly deplorable. And when you say that I, well, I haven't had any bad reviews yet, I'm looking forward to a bit of a fight, to tell you the truth. So, so I'm hoping for something from that. Well, so much for the effects of communism as at any rate are still with us. Now, it's also been said, to change the theme slightly, that the intelligentsia, in the sense we've been speaking of, has emerged to some extent in the West. 
uh, a, and, and that they, had, they maintain what you might call a, a certain similarity, even without accepting full dogmas, a, a tendency to accept certain matters without checking on them, and also to accept quick theories on how, to, how the state can manage everything. And I, I think that, that is also true. And I think it's also true that, of course, we get in the West, as, as there's no question that the, the state must have certain powers and the free market must have certain powers, there's always a borderline fighting area in which the bureaucracy, which I think Robert Michel says, it, it, it's failing. If it fails in the project, it doesn't affect the bureaucracy. They have another shot and recruit, recruit more people. So, and bureaucracy also, to some extent, has to, I think, have justification, in the same sense as the Soviet bureaucracy, uh, to have, have justification, not quite ideological, but an idea-type justification, to give it its drive. But the idea of simply, nowadays, of simply having good administration is all we used to need from a bureaucracy in the old days. But that, that isn't good enough. You've got to be cutting edge and, and, and be going across frontiers and things. And th that, of course, applies in particular to the uh, federal Europe idea. Because there you have an idea, which sounds fine, a big idea, a capital I idea. And, uh, and it gives them a justification. We are going forward into the highlands of whatever it is. And what happens? You, you get... You get, as you did in Russia, huge corruption with millions of dollars disappearing in Brussels. You get an incredible interference in minor matters. I mean, in, to, uh, the British are told what, what, how their beer should be brewed, what strawberries they should have, you know, that sort of thing. But in fact, in some respects, the Europe is, uh, European countries have less liberty in these matters than the, than the American states do. This monster has developed. It's also developed on the basis, on a false basis, because there are several objections to Europe. One of it is, as I say, super bureaucratization. But the basic one is that Europe is not a potential nation. It has none of the qualifications which go to make a nation, or indeed even a group of nations. It has not any ethnic, or legal, or historical background to cope with it. And all these, all these unified states like Yugoslavia and Russia and the Soviet Union have proved non-starters, and I'm sure that Europe will in the end, but it's going to give trouble. But more importantly, it's divisive of the West and is implicitly and often explicitly anti-American. Now, I think this is of major importance uh, from anyone's point of view in coping with the world as it is today. Because if we look at the world today, we cannot say we are out of danger. In my view, progress to a peaceful world is dependent on the eventual victory, isn't the word I'm after, prevailing of the American, British, and so on, culture the world over. But that wasn't going to be a short business. The, this, this is one of the things that affects Russia. There's a very good book on the difference between the provinces of Italy by uh, Robert Putnam. Uh, it, it's, they, they've had different historical experiences and they have different attitudes to the state and to personal um, cooperation and so on. And of course, Russia is far more so take Russia alone. It'll take a long time, because we think very often, particularly in things like political science, in terms of democracy and institutions, permitting that it, it's not just democracy and institutions, it's habits of mind. It's, it's a custom, and these things take a long time. It can be done and will be done, no doubt, but take it, it'll take some time, and meanwhile we are faced with great dangers. Now, how do we cope with those dangers? Well, I'm trying to stop myself saying too much about education. <laughs> but but, but um, first of all, we need to understand our own and the 
outside world in a way which I don't feel that is uh, that the academic world here, the academic order here, has fully grasped, or to some extent the, the, the political order has not fully grasped, and has indeed been miseducated. And uh, as Jefferson said, history should be the center of one's studies of the world, because at least you can see what happened when certain things were done. And I find that that is not followed, and if it is, the history is often distorted, let us say. And then, of course, the, the notion that all progress, all Western progress, is, based, is a matter entirely of conflict between various groups is not conducive to the flourishing of the Western community, and nor is the combination, I would say, of state and big capitalism into corporatism, which was, of course, objected to by Burnham. It's not, not so much the forms as the eroding of the consensual state, which is in question here. But when it comes to the foreign affairs, what we, we find ourselves, as I say, a long term trying to prevail and a lot of danger meanwhile. The first thing I think should be obvious, it doesn't seem to be obvious to everybody, is that the Western advantage in technology, and particularly in, um, in this case in arms technology, should be maintained and made unmistakably maintained. That is to say that it should be any advances should be developed and made available to the Western governments. Not much good making your advances if you don't translate them into weaponry, because the next guy will make them and do so. But so, in my view, the West should have weapon systems unmistakably capable of preventing attacks from anybody. And that also should follow policies which are unmistakable and, and, and totally without any dubiety. I don't see that happening now, but I mean, there are certain trends in that direction. And it also carries with it the notion that we are, we are not yet in an international, a truly international balance that we can trust everybody in the world to do the right thing if we all sign treaties with them. The, the, the signature of useless treaties is one of the most extraordinary matters before us. I mean, it was, there were, the, the Soviet Union had treaties of non-aggression non with all its neighbors and aggressed against practically all of them at various times. But we're, we're inclined to sign a treaty and think yeah, it sounds good, but the other people aren't going to obey it. And they, could, they wouldn't dream of keeping the treaty. If America signs a treaty, it keeps it. It puts us in the wrong. But I don't, it's not only that, it's that there is an agitation from feel-good Europeans more than Americans, I would say, to say, oh, the Americans are being wicked. They're defending themselves. You remember the famous remark of, was it Voltaire? Um, cet animal est très méchant quand on l'attaque, il se défend. So the, 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 and so, so the world we're into has not uh, yet become safe either physically or mentally. And we can do something about improving its physical safety, and we do a great deal about improving its mental safety, which I've tried to do to some extent here. I think I'll. I probably have about 30 questions available on every different question. So we'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, please raise your hand and wait for the, uh, for Carl who'll be bringing the microphone. Um, any questions for Dr. Conquest? I guess we have right up here on the right. Please. 
So if you uh, normalize uh, the situation in the uh, 20th century for the population increase, it seems that uh, the world is probably safer for the individual now than it was, say, in the uh, 15th century Scotland or time of the Roman Empire, I would think. But you want to comment on that? I don't have the figures, but, but um, the, there were periods then, the Black Death was as much trouble as any of the genocides here, of course, on the health side. But there were ups and downs then. We've had ups and downs. The first part of the century was, was far better than the second part, or the, the second 50 years. But, well, health, yes, sure. But it's not much good being healthy at being 90 years old if you've got a atom bomb dropped on you. But, I, I, but the, the, the health is extremely important. And um, again, it does come into foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Africa, for example. This raises a lot of issues which I don't, I don't really deal with. I read uh, The Great Terror many years ago, when, probably when it first came out, or very close to when it first came out. And I'm wondering what, what you have learned since the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and a lot of the archives have opened. Uh, what, what new things have, have you learned uh, since then that, that you can add in to The Great Terror? Well, I, d I did a second edition about 10 years ago. And there's a lot since then, quite a lot of new material. Uh, we know a lot more about the in the workings of the secret police and who they were. We, we have there's a great deal of detail. We I don't know that there's anything really essential, but the, but I do mean to do another edition, a definitive one. We've got enough to be definitive. Has the scale changed at all in terms of the, the number of people that were killed, the number of people that were incarcerated? Is that There's still argument about that, it, but it, there are ups and downs. Some, some figures have gone up and others have gone down. I mean, we certainly overestimated certain types of, of, of figures. But I mean, my figure, for example, for the number of executions under Stalin is about right now it increases slightly, whereas there are probably fewer in, in one of the other categories. But th that's a very difficult one to get right. We, we, we know a hell of a lot about a number of... The demonstration in Washington. One side says there are 100,000, another says there are 200,000. The police say... Th these are very difficult things to get, get correct. But we, we know, for example, up to 1937, we now have this, what used to be when I wrote the census of that year had been suppressed. There's an announcement that the census takers had been uh, arrested, they were shot, in fact, for, for lowering the population, <laughs> lowering the figures of the population. So they suppressed that census, got another one in 39. And we know, we know now that the 39 census was at least three million too much. I mean, there were three million on paper, non-existent, and probably more, actually. I mean, so that sort of thing is, is, does, is input, new input. Yeah. You mentioned the eroding of consen the consensual state through big corporatism. I wonder if you could expand somewhat on those thoughts. Well, this, this is not more than a, a general feel, but I get, I get the impression that if we take an example, take a country which is now producing a, a, a mixture of state and semi-free enterprise China. Now that's what we may say is a bad example, and America and Britain aren't going that way. But there's an enormous amount of intervention by the state and of acceptance of intervention by big companies, even here, I think. The, the, uh, I mean, which I, uh, to, to take a sort of minor example, it discourages uh, smaller companies if the big company accepts a foolish charge of some sort and pays a, a million dollars fine, which they do, they do. You remember that c curious thing, Texaco, where a, a, a director had 
was accused of having made a racist remark, which he hadn't really made, it turned out. And they just paid up. And well, can you imagine, a big company can afford to, as it were, bribe the liberals, to put it in a coarse fashion. And whereas uh, that's only a minor side of it. I don't think that here it's anything like as powerful as it would be, say, in Japan, or indeed to some extent in France, of course. In France, they now talk about pink fascism, which what they mean is that the, the, the deputies, quite a few of the deputies, are still bureaucrats. They're allowed to keep their jobs. Well, I'm in a high proportion. I've got it in here somewhere. And they overlap very much with the, with the, uh, with the trade unions and with the, the big corporations. Because only the big corporations can afford to exist and be, in effect, I won't use the word bribe, but let's say fixed a bit, uh, with the unions demanding more than the, st the country can really afford. I, well, there, there are several ways we can go on about that, but, but it's worth looking at. I, I expect you will do it. Uh, you mentioned the importance of the uh, American uh, United Kingdom model for the for humankind uh, in the future, uh, uh, and also the consensual society as a a model. Uh, what do you see in your years of observation of the United Kingdom and America as far as the trends uh, in uh, uh, moving forward uh, in the right ways to uh, bring about this uh, model throughout the world? Well, I, I think it's fair to say they're not going backwards, at least. The, the, but but um, there is encouragement in various ways. I have a chapter on imperialism and anti-imperialism. And after, after all, if the world is now a single world, it is due to Western expansion and now retraction. In principle, retraction while a new political class emerged in the colonial countries. But this varied very much from empire to empire. And, um, uh, and, 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 and and country to country, but there, there are, we still, after all, even I mean, in the former colonial countries or the eastern countries, they still talk in Western terms, even when they're doing the bad stuff. They take Marxism from the West. It, it's um, the, it, there is a sort of a level at which the country the place is Westernized, in not everywhere, but in a very large part of the world. And of course, now English is the, is the international language. And th th this will be increasingly so with new communications things. The, there's a book coming out by a guy on the English and the Anglo-American approach on this matter of communications and, and monetary side. And he uses the word, now what's he got? Um, how did it slip my mind? <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the, uh, in, in this, in our present time, the, uh, the revolution that is taking place in communications through the coming of the internet, I would assume would be a great uh, barrier for totalitarian governments. The, they have always re relied upon the control of communications in order to foster an acceptance of their policies and of their authority. How can they do that with a, in a nation where there are millions of, in, of internet uh, uh, users? And it would seem to me that this might be a, 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 an, over, an impossible task for totalitarian governments to, uh, to, to achieve and that the free communication of ideas which, which destroys them will not be, be uh, they will not be possible to, to hold that back. I hope I'm right, am I? Well, I think you're right up, up to a point anyway, because this was true even in Russia during the crises of 1991 when the, the fax machines all over Russia produced posters to go on the lampposts, which would have been impossible. The idea would have been impossible 50 years earlier. Uh, but on the other hand, there are regimes which seem to manage Iraq. I don't know how you get your message into Iraq. I mean, it, it's more difficult for them, but it, it's, they still have certain powers to resist the outside. 
It, it, it's, uh, it's hard to say. I'll tell you what the word I was thinking about, the Anglosphere, he calls it. <laughs> the the, the, internet, the English-speaking internet and everything else. But, but, but it's, uh, let, let's say there's still a struggle afoot. Um, yeah, in the, um, uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries, you saw the demise of, of Christianity, dar rise of Darwinism and so on, and the uh, rise of humanism and relativism. And what are your thoughts on that? Maybe communism's gone, but incipiently, it, you know, you have multiculturalism and so on in the United States, and you have the rise of egalitarianism and group rights, and if you can't base it on an objective truth, does not, does not that, in a way, uh, threaten freedom? And um, so do you see, is there, what, what would you have to say about that? Well, the assault on objective truth, of course, which is one of the educational errors which we see a lot of now, the Derridaism and so on, is of course a lot of nonsense, and all, all the all these that type. Uh, the the French uh, historian and a business and a friend of mine told me at a conference they were talking about the effects on c European culture of Hollywood films. You know the French were objecting, and he he got up and said, uh, uh, "Well, you know." A hundred soft porn Hollywood films do less damage in France than one French philosopher has done in America. Which, 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 which. But I, I don't think one can answer all the questions about the nature of religion and science and, and philosophy and so on. And I haven't really tried to answer those. They raise faith is one thing and. Organizations and other, and some nations are more religious than others, without being worse than others, and others you can't tell. Hi, I was I was wondering if you could talk about the idea of uh, federal Europe uh, in greater detail. It seems to me that uh, federal Europe, you know, kind of copycats the United States system of federalism in two major ways. First, the centralization of political power, and second, the redistribution of wealth from more wealthy states to less wealthy states. I remember when I was in the Irish countryside several years back, you would drive along the freeway and see all these signs talking about these structural funds, you know, this highway, you know, brought to you by the EC structural fun fund for this or that or what have you. And uh, what do you think uh, is the future of the uh, British pound? Yeah, the Irish, are, the Irish are doing fine. They're, they're, they've, they've boomed. It's one of the few countries in Europe that's really boomed, and in part because they, they quite sensibly took advantage of the European funds. But of course, some of those funds came from countries who weren't particularly wanting to give them. The, um, but um, the pound. Well, the betting is that. The, the government and the political class in England are sort of so vague and wimpish about Europe that they will try and drift it in. But there are, the, there are two very interesting polls. One of them shows that the English are about 60% against the euro. The other one was even more interesting. It was in The Economist about three weeks ago. And it, it said that it asked, in a crisis, what ally would you rely on? It came out 60% America, 17% from Europe. And th that's when you get down to the real rock bottom, is what the field would be in, 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 in Britain. Uh, I, I think that the whole European thing, it started off, as you know, to, to keep the, the idea was to stop the French fighting the Germans. Well, they should manage that on their own. We don't fight the, the Scotch. The, the, or the French come to that. But, 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 and the steel community and that sort of thing. Basically, the other thing about Europe economically is that it, it can't, in fact, stand. They, they cannot carry out their policies while not so much England, but Germany and France in particular. They went through the Thatcher Revolution, which did to some extent destroy the 
total power of the unions and the welfare state. Germany cannot afford its welfare state. And it can't get rid of it because it can't win an election if it does. That at least is gone in England. Um, Mr. Theroux mentioned at the beginning that the main gist of the talk was going to be what caused the ravages of the century. And it's always been a thought of mine that mere affluence creates these problems and that all the other things can sort of come from the fact that we have come in the last thousand years into making a lot of money. Money tends to be concentrated in a specific area and that people of a certain ilk tend to be drawn to where there are large amounts of money to be controlled. Uh, what is your opinion of that particular idea? Well, looking from the Soviet point of view, they weren't getting any money. They had a country which was very poor and they made it twice as poor. The, it, it, uh, I, it, it maybe they they probably wanted the money of the West, but they weren't prepared to to go through with it, to to make any changes which would get which would get make them prosperous. They did everything they could to ruin their economy, and which wasn't rich to start with. Uh, I think Sakharov said somewhere they they wanted a rich state with a poor population. They didn't even have the rich state. <laughs> It, it's hard to say. Uh, the, the, I, th I think to some extent when you're, there's a certain sort of money culture which does encourage people to, to think, oh, uh, what should I do now and kick and scream? You know that feeling. I get that in academe. <laughs> the, a, academe, remember, the, does not, it's not part of capitalism. It lives on capitalism. It's a parasitical on capitalism. They are paid large sums, but they're allowed to denounce capitalism and say, one thing I can't stand is it's all this capitalist stuff. <laughs> and they, they are, we are supporting a huge people. Uh, I was reading about, a, I can't remember his name, a professor who, who is now, him and his wife, and the, he getting between them about 300,000, who writes books not only praising Stalin, but praising, praising Mao and Stalin and saying they succeeded. And, and he hates capitalism. It's uh, pretty much conceded that this last century was a slaughter of Innocent men, women, and children were just unprecedented. And Rommel and Johnson talk about 170 million people. Uh, what is, in your opinion, the main reason that that took place in this last century? Well, uh, my theme really is that, it, it, that all the major slaughters were carried out by people who had accepted certain ideas and were putting them, accepting the, the, the rule of the totalitarian, identifying themselves with the totalitarian party and putting these ideas into practice. I mean, Hitler and Stalin, what they did was what they planned to do, what they were happy to do. It was not an accident. There are still there are academics in Germany who try to institutionalize and say, well, it was a matter of institutions. Well, it wasn't a matter of institutions, it was a matter of human motives and act actions. Institutions were there, but they used them. And I put the, the major blame on on the, the 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 people who accepted these man, man, maniac ideas, and that's been basically what my books, uh, the main context of my book. And I go into that. It's, it's not going to have some detail. Um, the uh, I'm asking uh, for. Uh, clarification. My interpretation of uh, the statements you made about the importance of the uh, British and uh, American uh, approach, I, I'm interpreting that, uh, that you're meaning uh, the uh, American and British his historical experience with classical liberalism. Uh, but perhaps you mean more than that, and that's uh, that, uh, or perhaps you mean something different. I, I'm assuming that you don't mean either the the experience of George Bernard Shaw or Neville Chamberlain as being part of that tradition. But uh, does the English language itself play a big role in what you're thinking of? And does 
uh, descendants from either America or Britain. Uh, I'm thinking, for, for example, of the Koreans and the Korean experience. Uh, is, is that part of what you would see as the, the positive future? Well, when I say the, the British and American, I, I'm not meaning anything racial. It, it, I simply mean the tradition, uh, the, particularly the common law, and, and not so much democracy as liberty political liberties, which are found, I mean, there are the, the countries, first of all, the countries which are like this, we can talk about England, Australia, Australia, and America, and so on, but also include the Caribbean countries and the Pacific Island countries, they have the same thing. There was a very good, interesting speech at a recent legal conference here, after the Chinese took over Hong Kong, by a, a Hong Kong lawyer, who, who said, uh, uh, Congressman Tucson, I think, he, he said, um, we, we, want, we want to keep the common law because we still, we can, we can refer to cases that took place in Wales in 1790, we can talk, or in New Zealand last year. He, he wanted the common law as a sort of general unificatory thing. Now, you could also argue, of course, that one of the points that I think we should be arguing, not that I do it very well, is that there is a, a, a falling off from the common law culture in both England and America and elsewhere in favor of too much legislation, too much continental style legislation. So the Marx said, give us power and we'll make everybody and all the intellectuals in the world bought it. And then the fascist said, power and we'll make Italy great or Germany great and, and some high percent of the intellectuals bought it. And now all the intellectuals have bought another big idea and that's we're going to save the earth, give us power. And uh, do you want to comment? Is it going to do well, much damage as fascists? Well, there's, there's nothing, let's just say, ethically wrong in, in a Marxist who says, I would like a society where everybody is happy. It wasn't the ethical basis of Marxism that was wrong. You could say that, the, 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 that even the Nazis, as, as the great Jewish writer Wesley Grossman says, even the Nazis thought they were doing, acting in the name of good. They thought it was good for the world to have the Germans running it and, and the good for the world to have the Jews killed. So their motives were, can be called, according to him, good. I don't think motives is quite the point. They, I, I think that the thing about it, I have a piece on ism in general, uh, <laughs> which I call ismology, in, in the book. And, and it's two ways, of course. That you can have environmentalism and feminism and, and various things of that sort, which might, may contain good points, which are taken to extremes. And I was, and this this is, this raises a question rather similar to the one about corporatism. I was quite astonished at the, you know, the, the, the attempt to feminize the infantry, because then they, they can't march as far, so that means that you don't have to march as far. It's nice and easy, the, the, like the fire brigades. Now, and then when they they tried to put women into men's barracks, which is a different point. Uh, Cohen, the, the Secretary of War, opposed it, but his generals accepted it. They'd been so buffaloed and bullied by, by activists, they didn't know they were just like these Texaco people. They wanted to give in. They feared they wouldn't get promoted. Well, even, even, the, even the present government's Secretary for, for, for Defense was against it. This is a horrible thought. Sorry, we're gone forever on that one. Yes. Uh, one of the uh, sections in your book deals with education, and I don't know if you spend much time thinking about younger people, but uh, could you, off the top of your head, throw out some books that you would like to see students in Britain and the United States, high school age students, reading. I, I'm thinking of One Day in the Life of Ivan Dinosovich, uh, Dinosovich and uh, maybe uh, Kessler's Darkness at Noon, things that you think students in high school should be reading. I think, I think Darkness at Noon is a, is a very good idea. 
um, it, 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 say it doesn't make, it doesn't f force its point home. You could you could read it and still be a, and say good if you wanted. If you're a, that happened, a French student once wrote to Kirstler saying your book converted me to communism. <laughs> so, 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 but but still, uh, no. Uh, uh, I think the first thing is to stop them reading nonsense, and, re and <laughs> because there's such a lot of nonsense. Taught, maybe not from books. I don't know if it's, it's done by sign language or something. <laughs> the, 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 but but um, if they could, if they could just te learn a certain amount of tolerable history, even even a, a, a certain types of Marxist history would be better than no history, which is what they get half the time. Mind you, they they get also a sub and pseudo Marxist histories, which are worse than Marxism. But but. Um, but uh, I don't know what, what kids read. We were forced, we, we read, I suppose when we were 12, I read the Breath of Dickens. I can't say I've read him much since. You know that feeling? Well, books that would illustrate the theme in your books, the huh. slaughter of the 20th century, how you could interest younger, younger readers. I know that's not your main audience, but uh, you know, people that work in high schools who, who have read your books, uh, want to know how we can interest young people who often are not interested in what they should be. I think it's a very difficult one in general to, to interest them. When I was young, to get me to write, look at something I didn't want to was really hard going, to force it. I, I, I don't go on, but the, I remember the worst book I was forced to read when I was doing Greek, when I was about 16, Attic Orators, four speakers in ancient Greece, and those boring speeches I've ever read in my entire life. <laughs> they, they, make, they make lawyers here look good. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't, have, shouldn't take up your time. One more, one more question. Um, do you place uh, Fidel Castro in the same class as Mao, Pol Pot, and Stalin? And do you have any explanation on why uh, Mr. Castro's been able to survive all these years? Well, I, I place him in the same category in, in a general sense, yes. And uh, uh, he has managed to ruin his country pretty well. <laughs> Most of the, the, the things that they've done, uh, he, he's managed. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how you... How you account for his survival? It, it's a it's a, a strange phenomenon. And what is more, you'd have thought that he would lay off and cool it down. He hasn't really. It, it's a very extraordinary phenomenon. I knew I knew an Englishman who was ambassador there for a bit, and he thought of Castro as quite a, a, a genial rogue. And he thought he thought he thought. Um, Guevara was a cold-blooded hypocrite. So, I mean, it, it was very much centralized. Well, I think partly because everybody there know, knows it can't last forever. They think it, organizing is very difficult. It's very difficult to organize. We were speaking about, about such things as um, communications. It's very difficult to organize if, if, the re, if the regime isn't on the point of collapse. But for all I know, it'll collapse tomorrow. The Sandinistas. You know, they, we thought, they thought they were in forever. And they made the mistake of having this public election. Did it, what a point I mentioned in my book, I'll, I'll send up on this. The, the, uh, a friend of mine was in, in Managua when they had the election uh, in which the Sandinistas lost. And he said in the hotel he was in, was several Western European left-wingers burst into tears. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's hope for something in Havana. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. It's, uh, it's a real pro pleasure to have Bob Conquest speaking here. Those of you who have not read his books, I certainly hope that you will do so. Uh, incidentally, for those of you who were having difficulty getting a copy earlier, we do have some additional copies now. And I know that Bob would be delighted to autograph copies if you would like to get a copy. This is a, uh, a real treat, I believe. Um, one thing I might add to what has been discussed is um, that the Independent Institute is an organization that is really not interested in politics. 
it really is inspired by the kind of scholars like Bob Conquest, who spent most of their life dedicated to pursuing truth, regardless of left and right, or the prejudice of the moment, or the biases, or even the claims that are made from officialdom. Uh, we don't think truth has a political position, but we do think that science and scholarship is an essential way to get to the truth. And the kind of things that we continue to see in the world today, the kind of xenophobia, the kind of nation statism that you find in, in too many places, is only able to endure when, pe when people simply do not have the facts. So I want to thank everyone for joining with us. Again, if you'd like to get a copy of Bob's book, there are copies upstairs, and we hope that you will join us again at our next program. Thank you and good night.